the in word at the moment is the word new. If you can say a thing is new, you can sell it. Try our new electric toothbrush with balanced power steering. <laughs> um, if, if it's new, it sells. And the trouble is, if a thing's not new, it's suspected. And that's partly why I chose that hymn. <clears throat> Tell me the old, old story. And one of the subtle temptations in our day is to be ashamed of something that's 2,000 years old. Because it's assumed that anything that's that old must be utterly obsolete and decrepit. <clears throat> but what we are discovering in the study of these strange cults is this to beware of the new. Anything that claims to be a new revelation, a new version of Christianity, a new theology or a new morality, anything that is new is suspect to the Christian until he's examined it closely. Now I suppose that if I'd said I was going to speak on anti-disestablishmentarianism, <laughs> you would have been none the wiser. I've written on the board Swedenborgianism. How many of you have heard about this? Ah, a few more than I anticipated. That's good. Well, now, I'll tell you when I first came, became aware of it. I went up to Lancashire as a minister, oh, many years ago now. Uh, my address, by the way, was 21 Eliza Street, Ramsbottom, <laughs> which um, <laughs> is just one of those addresses. But um, I went to Ramsbottom as the Methodist minister, uh, to Lancashire and I noticed that 50 yards down the road was a chapel looking very much like the Methodist chapel it was the same pseudo-gothic black stone and uh, I noticed that they had much the same things going on as we did the women's meeting on Tuesday afternoon and the Sunday school Sunday afternoon at 2.30 uh, I think and so on but I noticed it, that it was called the Church of the New Jerusalem. And this struck me as new because I hadn't come across that before. And then I discovered that this church was in fact in the local council of churches and that there was a pulpit exchange regularly and that I would probably find myself in that church and the minister there would find himself in mine. Well now quite frankly the scripture lays an obligation on me and on every preacher to find out what the other chap believes before you swap pulpits with him. And so I made it my business to try and find out a bit more about this Church of the New Jerusalem. Now I discovered that they used the Anglican Book of Common Prayer largely in their services. And there wasn't much difference between Evensong and Morning Song or Morning Prayer or whatever you call it uh, and the services that they had. They baptized infants by sprinkling. They had communion once a quarter. The government of the churches was Presbyterian in the sense of having synods and an assembly over the synods, a kind of pyramid of um, assembly. They had three kinds of ministers, those who ordained ministers, and they called them bishops, those who were ordained and administered the sacraments, and those who were ordinary lay preachers who took services. I found they had a college for training ministers at Woodford Green, that they had two kinds of membership, junior membership from 14 to 19 years of age, begun at confirmation, and senior membership begun at 20 after signing the Articles of Faith. I found they had a magazine, a weekly paper, an annual conference, and their own press, that there were about a hundred thousand members all over the world mm -hmm. but not too many in Britain and it seemed like an ordinary denomination. <coughs> I discovered later that Helen Keller belonged to this church and in Helen Keller's book My Religion she uh, speaks quite a lot about this particular approach to truth. Now, so far, so good, and so far there seemed nothing wrong with it, no reason why a pulpit exchange shouldn't be made, until I began to ask, what do they really believe, and what do they teach? 
And it was then that I began to hear about a man called Emanuel Swedenborg. And this movement that I'm speaking tonight is completely different from the other ones I've spoken of. It didn't start in America. Nice to have something they didn't invent. But mind you, <laughs> this isn't a great deal better than some of the things we've been looking at earlier. Nevertheless, it didn't come from America and it didn't start in the 19th century. It started way back in the 18th century, towards the beginning of it, in fact. And it's all tied up with this man, Emanuel Swedenborg, but he wasn't called that originally. His father was, in fact, called Swedberg, I would say that was, or Svedburg. I wouldn't know. How does one say that in Swedish? Anybody know? Well, now, the father of Emanuel was a Lutheran bishop in Sweden. And uh, at that time, even already, as soon after the Reformation as that, uh, the Lutheran churches of Sweden had become rather cold and rather formal and rather dead. And I've no doubt myself that Emmanuel reacted against that in what he later came to believe. He was born in 1688, so this goes back some way. He had an outstanding education. He went to four universities. He went to Uppsala. Uh, he went to Utrecht. He went to Paris. He went to Oxford University. He was a man with a tremendous brain. And he soaked in knowledge. And it was quite obvious that he was quite brilliant and a genius. I'm tempted to add at that point, he remained a confirmed bachelor all his life and was thus able to give all his attention to his scholastic interests and pursuits, unhampered by crying babies. In 1716, he was made the Royal Assessor of Mines for Sweden and was put in charge of all the mineral wealth of the country by the government, a very responsible position. And as a result, in 1719, because of his magnificent service to Sweden, the king decorated and honored him, and he decided to change his name in line with the honor given to him by the king, and he changed it to, to Swedenborg. So he put the name of his country into his name and called himself Swedenborg. So Emanuel Swedenborg was now a well-known, honored man in his own country. But he traveled many parts of the world, certainly of Europe. He wrote some 50 books, scientific textbooks on such things as metallurgy, mineralogy, physiology, geology, cosmo cosmology, come say it again, <laughs> study of the world, mathematics, <laughs> Mathematics, anatomy, <coughs> chemistry. Not only did he write books on all these subjects, he was an engineer and an inventor of no mean order. He developed plans for an aeroplane and for a submarine. Now, bear in mind the date. And he was planning aeroplanes and submarines. He said submarines would be able to attack the enemy fleet from below the surface of the sea and win a decisive victory. This was the brain that we're considering. He engineered the docks of Sweden. He invented a new stove for housewives, a new magazine air gun, decimal money, something strangely modern about this chair, how to tell where you were at sea by the moon, studied tides and the ocean depths, a brilliant mind, and somebody has described him as the Archimedes of the North. And there's no doubt about it, in his day, Emanuel Swedenborg was an absolute genius, one of the greatest brains there has been, a scholar, a scientist, honored and <coughs> esteemed all over Europe. Had he stuck to his science, he would have brought lasting benefit to mankind, and indeed he did. But there was another stranger side to his nature, Part of him was interested in the physical, and that led him to be a foremost scientist. 
but he was also interested in the psychical. And it was this side of his interest that led him into most unusual areas of thought. This led him to be a philosopher, a man who thinks, a man who loves wisdom, a man who gives answers to big questions, a man who ultimately pierces with his mind the mysteries of life. Now, let's see how it began. He did have the gift of clairvoyance. Now, that is seeing things. I'm sorry, we'll have to get some better chalk. That means seeing things that other people can't, indeed that can't be seen, seeing things at a distance. Two examples of this in his life will tell you what I mean. One day he was talking to the widow of a Dutch ambassador who was talking about a paper which she had lost, a paper of her husband's which was needed for some financial business and she'd searched everywhere and couldn't find it. He didn't know her or her house but he said there is a secret drawer in your husband's desk you will find the paper in that drawer, and sure enough, she did. Another example is he was 300 miles from Stockholm at a reception. And in the middle of the reception, he suddenly collapsed into a chair and said, there is a fire at my home in the street where I live. I can see it creeping nearer and nearer to my house. And then after some time of... Uh, acute distress, he said, it has stopped three doors from my home. Later he went home and discovered that there had been a fire that swept up the wooden homes of that street and had stopped three houses from his own. Now this is the gift of clairvoyance which he had. But it led to other things. And in 1743, began the strange things that led to Swedenborgianism. He had overtaxed his brain, which is not surprising, and he was in fever and delirium. But he began to see visions of angels, inhabitants of other planets, departed saints, and this went on for some two years until in 1745, one day, having overeaten, his sight went misty, he saw loathsome creatures crawling on the walls. This sounds very like the DTs at the moment. But then he said, a man stood in front of him who said, I am God, the Lord, the creator and the redeemer of the world. And this figure then told him to convey to the human race the experiences and visions which he was receiving. At the age of 59, he resigned all his government posts and gave up all his scientific research. And for the next 25 years, he wrote down the visions and the experiences that he was having. And he now added the phenomena of clairaudience, which is to be able to hear things, that's seeing things, that's hearing things. He also began automatic writing, which is just to let the spirits guide your hand as you write. And he produced 25 or 30 spiritual books which he published at his own expense and distributed to the universities and scholars who knew him well. Among these, there is one that I picked up in um, a second-hand barrow in London, uh, which some of you may have seen. Penguins have published quite a lot of his stuff. Uh, Heaven and Hell by Emanuel Swedenborg. He died in London in 1772 without founding any organization, any church or anything, but with one firm belief in his mind that in the year 1757, God had started a new church 
not on earth, but in heaven. And that this church would come down from heaven to earth. And was therefore what the Bible refers to as the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. He died believing the new church had already started up there, but before it had come down. And that pseudo-Gothic black stone chapel in Ramsbottom is part of the new Jerusalem that has come down from heaven and the other churches that call themselves by the same name. He was buried in 1772 in London, but the Swedish authorities exhumed the body, took it to Uppsala in Sweden, and he was buried with national honor in the cathedral where his grave remains to this day, the cathedral where the World Council of Churches met last year. And there in the cathedral of, at Uppsala, this scientist and philosopher, Emanuel Swedenborg, lies buried. Now there has been a terrific debate ever since as to what exactly happened to him in 1745. Was it that he had literally gone insane with study? It's possible to do that. Somebody once accused St. Paul of doing that. Your much learning doth turn you mad. And it is possible that this is what has happened. But I'm going to say that having studied his life, I do not believe he was at any point mentally unbalanced. I think he was overstrained occasionally. But for the rest of his life, even after 1745, he could talk utterly rationally and behave rationally in any society and did indeed advise the government in finance and politics in a remarkably able way. What happened was not insanity. It was that from 1745 he was practicing spiritism. This is what happened. He was now drawing knowledge that was not being filtered by his mind. He was contacting spirits and it's interesting that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle claims that Swedenborg was an outstanding spiritualist medium. I think you can see why I've taken this tonight after last Thursday. Partly because of this and partly because of his teaching on life after death which links up with Sunday morning. He had claimed to have contacted Cicero, Paul, Augustine, Luther and Calvin during these visions to have argued with all of them, to have got the better of them <laughs> and to have had a confession from all these four that they were mistaken in their understanding of Christianity, which is quite a claim. But in fact, this is not the activity of an unbalanced mind. It is the activity of a mind that is gripped by spirits. A mind that is willing to accept any supernatural revelation. Now we come then to what Swedenborg believed. Because shortly after his death, various people took up his ideas and popularized them. I wonder if you've heard of the Ge German poet Goethe. Have you heard of his um, Faust? Now what you may not realize, if you've studied this at school or read it since you left school, what you may not have realized is that Faust is the popularizing of Emanuel Swedenborg's views on life after death. And Goethe's Faust is simply doing this. There was a Methodist printer in Clerkenwell called Robert Heinmarsch and he took up Swedenborg's ideas and he started a society which you'll see advertised on the London Underground. Have you seen the advertisements of the Theosophical Society? Well now Robert Heinmarsch, this Methodist printer from Clerkenwell, was simply trying to put across many of Swedenborg's ideas. So you begin to see that this man you've probably never heard of 
has quite a profound influence and has crept through into a lot of things. But it was in fact in 17, let me get the right date, 1787 to 1788, that the new church of the new Jerusalem was started, which was simply Swedenborgianism, good and proper. The whole thing became the basis of the church. Now, when you examine what a church believes, the two things that you must ask are, first of all, what does it base its beliefs on? Where does it get them from? And then secondly, if that is the basis, what kind of beliefs come from it? Now, if anybody asked you what is the basis of your belief, I would hope you would not say the Baptist Union Declaration of Principle or the Constitution of Commercial Road Baptist Church. I would hope you would say three things. That the basis of my faith is the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. And it's important to say all three. Because you can say one without two and three if you're not careful. And I would take it, or I'm being very frank, you, this may not be your position, it's certainly mine, and I think it's what is understood by the evangelical position, that we base our beliefs on the Bible, and not just the bits of it we like, but the whole of it, and nothing but it. That's where we base our beliefs. And if you cannot prove it on those three grounds, it is not to be believed. And therefore we come to certain conclusions, certain beliefs. As soon as you accept that basis, you believe certain things about God, certain things about men, certain things about Jesus, certain things about salvation, certain things about the Holy Spirit, certain things about the church and certain things about the future. And you will find that those who make that their basis come to the same beliefs about this. Quite astonishing. They may never have met, they may never have discussed it, but when they meet they find that on fundamental beliefs they are united because they have started from the same basis. Now let's ask Emanuel Swedenborg, what is your basis? And he would say straight away, it is the Bible. But then Mary Baker Eddy said the same thing, and Joseph Smith said the same thing for the Mormons, and Judge Rutherford and Russell say the same thing for the Jehovah's Witnesses. They all say our basis is the Bible. But the first difference is that they can't say that. And this is where things begin to go a little awry. Most of these sects we have been studying say that you need something else as well as the Bible to get the whole picture. And they usually go back to one man or one woman who claims to have received a revelation from God that supplies the plus, without which you can't know the truth. Whether it's Mary Baker Eddy's Science and Health or the Book of Mormon with Joseph Smith or in this case Emanuel Swedenborg's writings, you must have the Bible plus. And it's the plus that makes the difference. It's like loading luggage into a canoe. There's a limit to what you can add and it's a very low limit. And after a bit, as you add just one more thing, the whole thing turns upside down. And this is what happens. Furthermore, you'll find that Emanuel Swedenborg couldn't say that either. And having argued with Paul in a vision, he had, of course, he was almost morally bound to reject all of Paul's letters from the Word of God. But he didn't stop there, he rejected others too. So that though Emanuel Swedenborg published books which claimed to be expounding the Bible, we can say that three things he was doing were wrong. First of all, he was making additions to the Bible. Now, here's a book about heaven and hell, 320 pages, 
the most intimate details about both places that I have never seen anywhere else in my life. Now occasionally there is a scriptural text or reference, but there are pages of details, some of which actually contradict the Bible. For example, he says you will be able to marry in heaven, but his description of children in heaven, a detailed one, is clearly an addition to the Bible. He certainly didn't get, I would think, nine-tenths of the matter in this book from the Bible. And while it's fascinating detail, if you want to know what you'll be doing in heaven, here you are. But there's no guarantee that he's right. It's an addition. And so he has added his own revelation to the Word of God. Once you make an addition, you must come to a different interpretation. And he had a unique way of interpreting the Bible. He said every passage has three different meanings. The first he called, let me get the, get it right, the natural meaning, which is what it says. Now, I would have thought we, we could stop there. But he doesn't. He goes on. There is, secondly, a spiritual meaning, or what he calls an internal meaning. It is a hidden meaning, which he can give to you, which would not be seen unless he did. And the third is the celestial meaning, which is a heavenly meaning. Now, let's just tell you that if an ordinary man, Swedenborg said, read the Bible, he could only see the natural meaning, what it says. A Swedenborgian, or his teaching, uh, a spiritual man can see a different meaning in it altogether. And an angel can see a different meaning again, because angels do read Bibles in heaven, and they get meanings out of it that we couldn't possibly. Well, now, he admitted that he didn't know what the angels made of it, so we can <laughs> trust that one out. <laughs> Presumably, when we get to heaven, we can ask them what they make of the Bible. But he did make this important distinction that passages in the Word of God don't just mean what they say, they mean something else. And of course, once you start on this line, mind you, I've heard preachers do it, and I've perhaps done it myself occasionally. Um, instead of just saying what it straightforwardly says, you, you sort of allegorize it, you spiritualize it, and um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. Uh, oh, it's so easy to do. <laughs> No, I can't just think of it. Don't people analyze the details of the parable when the point of the parable is the story? Yes. Well, the parable of the Good Samaritan is a case in point. Now, that, the natural meaning is he is a man who helps somebody else. But spiritualizing would say, ah, well, the Good Samaritan stands for Christ, and the man who fell among thieves is the poor sinner battered by Satan, and the two pence paid to the innkeeper is the ransom paid to redeem the sinner. Uh, are you getting me? Mm -hmm. Now, you've probably heard sermons like that if you... Want a good example? Naaman the leper is an outstanding example. And you'll find this again and again. Now, we've got to be very careful about giving scriptural passages a meaning they don't have themselves, other than the natural, obvious, clear meaning. But when Swedenborg got busy, the spiritual meaning seems to have little or nothing to do with the original passage. The trouble was that there were many books in both the Old and the New Testament that he found he couldn't do this with. They were just so obvious that you couldn't twist it or couldn't find any other meaning. You know the, the saying, he who laughs last has seen the wrong meaning. Well, um, <laughs> it was a bit, of, a bit of a case of this, looking for subtle meanings that weren't there. Well, now, for example, he tried the book of Proverbs, and that's full of natural meaning. It's full of natural common sense. It's full of most down-to-earth things. And he said, there must be a deeper meaning in this. So he looked hard at it, and he looked at it, and he looked at it, and he couldn't find a spiritual meaning, as he called it, within the passage. And so he said, Proverbs can't be the word of God. It hasn't, it hasn't got a hidden meaning. He treated most of the wisdom literature, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, I've heard some wonderful spiritual meanings given to the Song of Solomon. But you know, the basic meaning of that is this, that right there in the heart of the Bible is a description of sexual love.
That's the meaning of Song of Solomon. We're afraid of that and so we spiritualize it in all kinds of ways and evade the clear statement, here is a most wonderful, ennobled, erotic song saying that God made sex and here is a love song in the middle of the Bible. And we will evade that meaning and spiritualize it. So we're, we all do it to a degree. Well now, he couldn't make anything of those, but when he came to the New Testament, he found himself in greater difficulty. And he couldn't find the hidden meaning except in the four Gospels and the book of Revelation. <coughs> and so he took his scissors and he cut out everything between. And that's all you're left with. Now you see, the mistake he made was to decide what the Bible should be before he read it. And then try to fit the Bible into his ideas. And because he couldn't fit it all in, he snipped away. Now, lest we criticize him, let us say that one of the commonest things that happens today are people deciding in advance what the Bible should say, reading it, finding parts of it don't fit into their ideas, and cutting it out, saying that can't possibly be accurate. The Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. And therefore, having interpreted it this way, he was then guilty of subtraction, taking away from it. And many parts of the Bible, which are the word of God, are no longer allowed us by Swedenborg. So that he could not say, the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible is my basis. He was saying, the Bible, plus my addition, my interpretation, and therefore my subtraction from it. Now, if you get the basis wrong, you'll get the building wrong. If you get the foundation wrong, the whole structure will be wrong. And it does not matter at which point you touch any of these beliefs and ask, what does Swedenborg teach? You find that it's different from what we believe. Take one or two examples, and I'll just go through these quickly. What about God? First thing is, God is a man. That's quite a statement. God is a man. He called him the eternal God-man. And when Jesus came on earth, this was no change. It was the God-man coming to earth. Furthermore, God is not a trinity. It's three persons. He's only one person. And therefore, when Jesus came, that was the whole of God coming. It was God changing his address. Not his nature, he was always man, but changing his address. And the Trinity, he did not like one bit. Furthermore, he went on to say that God is all mercy and will never punish sins. He is only mercy, only compassion. So he didn't like the idea of the Trinity, that God is three persons in one. He didn't like the idea of God, a just God, and he emphasized the compassion and mercy of God, and he added this strange notion that God was always human. When we come to men, man has complete free will and is free to save himself, and he must do so. It is man who must save himself, not plead for somebody else to save him. Evil, however, is in his nature because there is no personal devil, and I think that's important, no devil. All the temptation we have comes from within. There is evil in our nature, but we are free to save ourselves by reforming and conquering the evil within our nature. When it comes to Christ, of course, Christ was not the Son of God before he was God himself. There is only one God, and all Jesus was, was God visiting earth. That's all. Presumably God was no longer in heaven when Jesus was on earth. Jesus had an evil nature because he was tempted, and since there is no devil, he must have been an evil person. And do you follow the logic here? If there is no devil and temptation comes from within, from the evil in you, then Jesus must have had evil in him. And according to Swedenborg, he got it from Mary. The cross 
was not an atonement for sins, but his final battle with the evil in his own nature, the temptation. It didn't save anybody, it doesn't redeem anybody. He was simply winning his biggest battle over his own evil. The resurrection, Jesus did not rise in the body. He rose simply as a spirit. We're back into spiritism again here. No resurrection of the body. Now what about salvation? The one belief that Swedenborg could not stand at any price was justification by faith that a man, when he believes in Jesus, is accepted as righteous by God. And he said he'd had a terrific argument with Martin Luther in a vision over this, and Martin Luther had finally confessed heresy and hypocrisy in teaching this. Now, frankly, the whole Reformation hinged on that, justification by faith. And this Swedenborg could not accept. The Holy Spirit is not a person but an it, not he but it, a force. The church, well there is no true church except the New Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven. The future, Christ is not coming back again personally. He came to Swedenborg in 1757. There will be no day of resurrection there will be no day of judgment. What happens when we die? We all survive as spirits and as the good or the evil in our nature gets the better in the next world, gets the stronger, we will either gravitate gradually up to heaven or to hell. Swedenborg always talked about heavens and hells. Don't know quite why that, but he always talked in the plural. <coughs> And so when we die, our bodies are finished with forever, there's no resurrection, our spirits go on into a spirit world, and depending on which way we've got them heading when we die, they will gravitate sooner or later uh, to one or other position. In the heavens, men change into angels. Now, funnily enough, while he talks an awful lot about angels, he doesn't believe in them. According to my understanding of the Bible, here are the animals, here are the humans, here are the angels in God's created order. What is man? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. This is where we are. Angels are not men. They're a distinct order of being. They're quite different from men. We're told that in heaven, this is what we're told in the Bible, redeemed humans will be over the angels, which is quite an amazing uh, belief, but it's there in Hebrews and many other parts of the New Testament. We are to judge angels. We're to be redeemed and occupy the position of Christ, which will be above the angels. Do you realize that angels will serve you in heaven as now they serve God? But one thing is quite clear in the Bible, humans never turn into angels. But you'd be amazed how many people believe that, that when you die you become an angel and uh, you're off, you know? Um, harp and wings and you're there. In heaven we marry, in heaven, he said, children are allowed to go to heaven, indeed all children who die go to heaven, but uh, they are from time to time allowed to sin, to remind them that they're not there under their own steam, as it were. Now all this is pure speculation. I'm often asked what happens to children when they die. My answer is, the Bible doesn't say it and therefore I mustn't. But what I'm quite sure of is this. If a child of mine died, I would say quite certainly, I know God well enough to trust him to do what's right. I think that's the one thing that you need. If you start speculating about what happens and start saying things that aren't in the Bible, you can be in real trouble. And Swedenborg did speculate. <coughs> Well, my conclusion from all this is this. Can you see certain similarities here to the kind of thing that we've studied in Christian science and spiritualism in a number of these other things? Do you realize that there are certain doctrines that devil hates? There are certain beliefs that the devil will get out of people's minds if he possibly can, one way or another. Let's see what they are. 
For one thing, he hates anybody to believe in a personal devil because that puts them on their guard. And if he can persuade people that he doesn't exist, he's laughing. He doesn't like the doctrine of the Trinity. He doesn't like the belief that God is a God who punishes. He doesn't like the belief that man is not free to save himself. He doesn't like the belief that Jesus was born of, virg of a virgin and remained sinless and died in the place of sinners atoning for their sin. He doesn't like the belief that we rise from the dead with a body. He doesn't like the belief to go on that the Holy Spirit is an it, as is a he and not an it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one spirit more powerful than the devil. And he doesn't like people thinking about the Holy Spirit and believing in the Holy Spirit as a person and a powerful person. Above all, he does not like the belief that after death comes resurrection and judgment. And he does not like the belief in a hell to which God sends people. I forgot to mention that Swedenborg taught that God would never send anybody to hell, that they would go there of their own volition. Now that is not biblical. According to the Bible, Jesus says, depart from me, go into that place. Incidentally, he said that he saw into hell, Swedenborg saw into hell and saw Moravian missionaries there, which I think must be one of the greatest libels of history, if you've ever read the story of those Moravian missionaries. The devil does not like certain fundamental beliefs. He either starts a sect or a cult that denies them and encourages people to accept this easier faith, and a spiritualist said to me last Thursday that they found their faith with no judgment and no punishment of sin much easier and more comforting than ours in this church. I'm sure it is. It would be jolly comforting to me not to believe in these things. The point is not, is it comforting, but is it true? Is it right? It would be an awful comfort that was built on a lie. Above all, the idea that when you believe in Jesus by faith and believe in his death on the cross for you, your sins are forgiven and you are going to heaven. The devil hates that. It cuts against the pride of men who want to work their passage and be good enough to go. And so he hates all these. It's interesting that Paul once said this. Paul notice. And Paul's gospel is the only gospel there is. If anybody asks me what my gospel is, it's in print. It's in Paul's letter to the Romans. That's my gospel. It's the only one I know. It's the only one there is that's Christian. And Paul once said, I preach the gospel to you in Galatia. He says, if anybody ever comes with something different, whether it be a man or an angel from heaven, now that's very significant. You can't even trust angels to tell you the gospel. Even if angels come from heaven and tell you something different, you must let the curse of God be upon them, for they're going to lead you astray from what saves you. And I think that Emanuel Swedenborg was not consciously, as a man, working out another gospel. I think he laid himself open, brilliant brain though he had, great genius <laughs> though he was, he allowed angels from heaven to preach another gospel to him. A gospel which is not a gospel. I think the only comforting thing I can tell you about Swedenborgianism is that it has not really caught on. A hundred thousand sounds a lot and I tremble for those one hundred thousand. But it didn't really catch on as many of the other groups did. The Jehovah's Witnesses are millions within just a few years. But over three centuries or two centuries, Swedenborgianism is still comparatively small. I end up where I began. I'm afraid we didn't have the pulpit exchange. And it seems very important to me that whether a church has been established a long or a short time in a place, whether you know the people go, who go or not, the important thing is, what do they really believe? Is it the same gospel? And quite clearly it was not. Living at the same time and dying within a year or two of Emmanuel Swedenborg, 
was another man called John Wesley. Great brain, great man, a man with a multitude of many interests, a man with interests in science, interest in education, interest in social reform, interest in abolition of slavery, a man who was in many ways a remarkable parallel to Emanuel Swedenborg, but a man who said that his basis for his faith was the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. And the results of these two men's work bears comparison. When John Wesley died, three quarters of a million people in these islands were Christians. And a secular historian writing the social history of England, green isn't it? Uh, a sec secular historian wrote, the early Methodists were like a cluster of chaste snowdrops growing on a foul rubbish heap. That's the difference. And it's the difference between two Gospels and one of them is not. Well, I hope in a sense that you never do have to know much about Swedenborgianism. But you know why I'm taking this series? I'm trying to teach you more fully your faith. Because you can see which parts of it the devil would most like you to get rid of. And you can see what he tries to attack when he gets the chance. May God keep us faithful to our own.